more optimistic. Uh, but they have obviously been watching the same weather predictions that we have and know that, you know, this can be called off just, just minutes or seconds beforehand. So we've been talking to people here all day long about sort of the emotions they're feeling and and how much this is needed, uh, basically considering all of the sadness and outrage that our country is experiencing through all of these uh, events. And these folks here feel nothing but positivity and energy and seeing innovation, uh, a historic moment, if you will. They are, they are ready for it. They are eager to see it. Uh, and they have been waiting it out. Even when the showers came, you didn't see people uh, pack up their gear and leave. They sat in their car, they waited for 20 minutes, and they got right back. Uh, to their spot. Looks so, like it's going to go. Look at all the smoke. Of excitement and anticipation, uh, but also sort of, as you said, it's not a great sign to know that those thunderstorms, those those lightning strikes, they can be, you know, just minutes from launch and, and basically scrub this as it did on Wednesday. We've been watching the Trump and Pence family viewing uh, spot a platform set aside for them along with the NASA administrator. Also, uh, apparently temporary, temporarily declared a no mask uh, zone for the president and vice president of our country. Let's real quick here. We're under a minute and a half. Bring in retired NASA astronaut Peggy Whitson. A total of 665 days in space. The U.S. record holder placing eighth on the all-time space endurance list. Chris Hadfield, we're so happy to have back. First Canadian to walk in space, former commander of the International Space Station. Um, and as we bring in our guests, uh, again, I'm no meteorologist, but it, um, the, uh, we're, we're hoping this remains clear. Peggy, to you for 15 seconds, and then Chris, and then we've got to open up the, uh, open up the countdown. Well, we are definitely uh, excited about this, and my fingers are crossed that the weather will stay just far enough away that we can get this vehicle off the ground. Uh, I think uh, everyone's holding their breath right now. <laughs> Commander Hadfield? It's great that tens of thousands of people have gathered to watch something that shows uh, what America can do so well. Uh, a real beacon of hope right now. We just need a little little hole in the weather. My fingers are crossed for the weather also. Uh, but uh, the crew is ready and the rocket's ready. Okay. All right, we will lay back and listen to mission control. Yes, is armed for launch. Under a minute now, the FTS, the flight termination system, has been armed. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. Wow. SpaceX Dragon, we're go for launch. Let's light this candle. Can you imagine how this is? 30 seconds. It looks pretty cloudy to me. Stage one tanks pressing for flight. T-minus 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. Lift off of the Falcon Line and Crew Dragon. Go Good Space Dex. Godspeed. Bottom dog. So rises the new era of American space flight, and with the ambitions of a new generation continuing to dream. 20 seconds into flight stage, but propulsion is nominal. T plus 30 seconds into this historic mission. Flying crew on board Dragon and Falcon 9, and look at them go. Falcon power to nominal. And what do you throttle down? We're throttling down to get ready for the period of maximum dynamic pressure. We're in the throttle rocket. Reports say all systems are go. Vehicle is supersonic. We've exceeded Mach 1 on the Falcon 9. And what do you throttle up? We're throttling back up to full power as we're through oh, next Q. Copy one, Bravo. Did we hear 
and that one Bravo call out, that's just the second abort zone that they're in. They'll continue to be on this until the first age has done its job and they switch over to the second. At this point, Bob and Doug pulling about 2.3 Gs, 2.3 times the Earth's gravity, already moving at over 1,500 miles per hour. We've heard the call out for MVAC engine chill. That's getting the MVAC engine ready to light. That'll come at about 2.44 into flight. Right now, everything continuing to look good. Next major event coming up is going to be the triple. We'll have main engine cutoff of the nine first stage engines, stage separation, and then ignition of the second stage engine to continue to carry astronauts into orbit. Coming up in about 20 seconds. And what do you throw down? We heard we're throttling down the Merlin engines on the first stage. And we have Miko. Miko. Falcon stage separation confirmed. Well, to our two astronauts joining our crew, Peggy and Chris, I don't know much, but the black stuff sure looks like it's in space already, having just left the space coast of Florida. Uh, Peggy, your reaction to what we are witnessing? So this is fantastic. We've gotten through the first stage. Uh, we still have a ways to go, several more minutes before they'll get all the way to orbit, but it's great. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, the SpaceX team is going to be bringing back that stage one at the same time. So we'll be seeing that landing probably at the same time as these guys continue up into orbit. Uh, it's about eight, a little over eight and a half minutes for them to get there. And I always think it's very amazing to think that you go from zero to 17,500 miles an hour in eight and a half minutes. And people at home heard that number correctly. Uh, it's considered the nominal speed for orbit, 17,500 miles per hour, along with our usual proviso, don't try this at home or on the interstate. Chris Hadfield, for, for those of us with any age on us, the number of changes is so uh, gripping. Look at the thrust of the Saturn V rocket that that took the NASA astronauts uh, to the moon back in the day, summer of 1969. It had seven million pounds of thrust, give or take. This had one million pound of thrust, give or take. It, how, is, uh, how are they able uh, to use a rocket given that difference in thrust? And what else are the notable differences as you look at this mission compared to your last mission, for example? Part of it, Brian, is, is like if you look at what the Wright brothers flew back in 1903, and then you compare that to what we know is a great design for a jet airplane today, we've learned a lot since the very first rockets that went up. We learned a huge amount with the space shuttle, and luckily uh, the folks at NASA, at SpaceX, Elon Musk, they've been able to, to learn from all that, to optimize it, to refine the design, to make it super efficient. And when you can make something simple and refined, then it becomes safer and then it becomes cheaper. And it's wonderful to see. I, I got my heart in my throat watching each one of these critical steps go by. But when that first stage is coming back to Earth now, when it's separated, that second engine cleanly lit, vehicle stably accelerating, that, as Peggy said, uh, about five miles a second because they're going to be in orbit here now, that, that's a big threshold to get over. Nobody more focused than Bob and Doug and Fox. Boy, I'm, I'm cheering them on from here. Uh, uh, Chris, veteran pilots sometimes get agita when they look at flat screen cockpits. Uh, on the left hand side, that picture, this is. This is driving a Tesla with an attitude, really. Uh, there isn't an analog, um, uh, you know, old school mechanical dial or gauge in that cockpit. Um, you can't help but think, what if you lose electronics to the flat screen? 
does it give you any agenda looking at how modest by comparison the dashboard is Apollo had the entire facing wall with the crew of three was all given over to gauges, dials, and switches. Yeah, well, the, the trouble, with, I mean, Peggy and I have both flown the shuttle, and she's a long-time pilot as well, but uh, the trouble with 500 switches is that 500 switches that can fail. If you can make things simpler and as reliable, then you've got a really elegant thing. And I've flown several airplanes that are completely fly-by-wire. Your, your stick is, is not connected to anything mechanically. You're just talking to computers. So long as it's designed well and it's trustworthy, that's what we're really after. The simpler, the better. And it's not a high traffic area. There's no trees in the way. It's actually a pretty good application for for a, uh, a computer-driven system. It's a well-known environment now. So I, I'm all for it. And, and uh, I, 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 Peggy and I both own the shuttle and the Russian Soyuz, but both of us would itch to have a chance to fly on board this, this vehicle is I'm really glad they are. Uh, and Peggy, before I give the same question to you, just to tell our viewers, nothing's wrong. On the right-hand side of your screen, the picture you're seeing is one of the marvels, one of the miracles about a truly reusable spacecraft. That is a re-entry engine firing. Those are mesh foot pads that have flared out on all four sides. Those are the clouds of Florida you see. And if this camera shot holds, it's going back. Uh, it's going to go back, punch through the atmosphere, punch through the cloud deck, and it's going to land itself on a barge to live and take astronauts into space another day. So while we watch that process, on the left-hand side of the screen, the astronauts are safely in space, and we, we indeed lost the re-entry shot for just a moment. Uh, Peggy, same question to you about analog versus digital. I know that the, the uh, glass cockpit flat screens depict analog instruments because at a glance, that's what a pilot requires. Do you miss any of the old stuff? Actually, not really. I think uh, the more we modernize even our aircraft, the more this seems natural that our spacecraft would also be modernized like this and, and go with the glass cockpits. It's really, I think, important that we keep pushing the technology to improve and get us the next step uh, up. I, I, uh, I'm really excited to see it. I know that our folks, our NASA astronauts and our NASA crews were also involved in the development and, and helped to ensure that we felt everything was safe and, and going to be successful on this mission. And, you know, we had to do a lot of talking about touch screens and how to make those most effective. For instance, there's a little ledge where the guys put their fingers in to anchor so they can actually touch accurately on the screen. So there were little things like that that they had to come up with uh, to make it very successful. And I, I'm really excited uh, that things seem to be going so smoothly. And as you said before, landing the stage one is hugely critical to reducing the costs of spaceflight, and I'm so thrilled that, that SpaceX has been doing this so successfully. By the way, to our audience watching, that shot of the barge with the rocket on it that wasn't on the barge a second ago, no big deal, that's how that is done. It appears there is a T-Rex that has made an authorized trip into space with them, at least, at least a um, inflated version. Um, the idea of astronauts taking trinkets um, and uh, merch on board spacecraft. I won't ask our two astronaut guests to detail all the stuff they have brought into space over the years, but it goes back to Alan Shepard, by the way, the first guy to utter the words, let's light this candle, the words that started this mission. Uh, but the first stage is back on Earth, at least on a barge, uh, one of the true wonders and marvels of modern space flight as reimagined um, by SpaceX, uh, uh, part and parcel of the empire of Elon Musk, who reimagined the automobile with Tesla, and now, assuming these guys hook up with the International Space Station, 
um, has reimagined space travel, getting Americans into space, on board an American-made spacecraft. Um, I'll throw in my usual advertisement, especially for anyone with young children who may be interested in space flight. Go ahead and register your phone with NASA. Uh, spot the station. You put in your zip code and you get a notification every time the International Space Station is going to overfly your area. It's a sight to behold on a clear night. It's the most uh, notable bright spot in the sky as it passes over you. And it's fascinating to know that it's 220 miles up, give or take 17,000 uh, miles an hour. Uh, Chris Hadfield, uh, sum up what you're seeing and the nice trick it represents when the first stage lands back on Earth. Yeah, Brian, you talked about kids. Both Bob and Doug have young kids. But I'm sure they brought along that little T-Rex as a thing to show that now we're suddenly weightless. The engines have shut off. They're getting rid of the trunk here now, the part of the vehicle that they didn't need uh, on the way up. Uh, the, sort of a, the, the inner stage there. So uh, things are going perfectly. They are in space. It, it has worked. Americans are back in space, an American-made vehicle, for the first time in a decade since we retired the shuttle. It's a really big moment. And this, is, this isn't this is the end of something. This is a door being kicked open. This is a new technology, a new capability that so many people are going to ride in the future. I'm just, I'm so pleased for everybody involved, especially with the trying circumstances in the country right now, to see this level of success of, of what people can really do together. It's, it's a great moment. Yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. We were up late with um, the coverage last night of some of our great gleaming American cities in flames. Uh, we woke up to uh, smoldering embers in those same great cities. We woke up to reports that there are uh, perhaps even uh, foreign uh, financed agitators in our midst uh, as part of the population uh, of protesters whose aims, though fueled by anger and sadness, were a hell of a lot more pure than some of the political motives being alleged today. Uh, this gives us uh, uh, a badly needed break. This gives us the chance to think about uh, something bigger and better than ourselves, and those pictures sum it up. On the right, again, anyone old enough to remember the grainy pictures from Apollo 11 when they achieved uh, orbit, the grainy pictures from the surface of the moon, now we're watching in high definition the glass cockpit, the touchscreen panel, inside the flying Tesla that is the SpaceX Dragon. Tom Costello covers all things aviation for us. He is at the Kennedy Space Center. Well, Tom, they did it. Yeah, can I just lose all objectivity and say, wow, that was cool. Uh, you know, it's been nine years since I have stood here for a manned mission. Uh, you and I have both been down here at the Kennedy Space Center over the years watching those marvelous shuttle liftoffs uh, from Pad 39A, and then we've been in this nine-year pause while the Russians were allowing the American, were giving the Americans a ride at the tune of, by the way, 83, 86 million dollars per seat. And so now, uh, back on an American rocket headed for the space station, uh, it's it's a great day. Uh, and what's nice about it is it's a part bipartisan great day. I think the whole country rejoices in this. A couple of interesting factoids here, Brian. Uh, the mission for these two astronauts will last anywhere from one to four months. They don't know. Imagine that you have to go into space and you don't know uh, how, how many pair of underwear to bring. Well, they don't know because they want to give this rocket and they want to give Dragon a, a real good test run. So now the rocket has completely separated from Dragon. Dragon is the spacecraft, if you will, the space ship. It's on its way to the space station, rendezvousing after a 19-hour trip sometime tomorrow. So over the course of the next 19 hours, they will incrementally increase their pitch and their altitude to get on the same orbit with the International Space Station and then go into docking mode. And, uh, and that's where all of this comes together and they will see for sure that all of this technology is performing as well as advertised. Keep in mind, this is the same vehicle, essentially, the same, same spaceship that has been setting up cargo for some time under the SpaceX brand name, 
now is carrying two Americans, uh, Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin, who could not be more unassuming American heroes and really, I think, represent the best of what this country uh, is all about, right? Experience and expertise and military commitment and service and science. Uh, and it's just, it's a great day for this country that could use a great day. By the way, the president and the vice president, both here today, uh, and they were the president arriving just before this liftoff. Really, I was afraid he wasn't going to make it in time because he, he cut it kind of close. But uh, he didn't arrive, he didn't get to see the liftoff at 322 Eastern time. And every single data point hit right on the money. Uh, from max Q, which is, as you know, is when you have the maximum forces on a spaceship, to Miko, main engine cutoff, perfect, to uh, the secondary cutoff of the engine, perfect, to separation, and then that signature SpaceX move, if we could celebrate it one more time, nobody in the world does it like SpaceX. They land the rocket back down on Earth on a barge in the ocean. That's just absolutely phenomenal. One last bit of trivia for you, Brian, because I know you love this stuff. As they were flying up the East Coast, Keep in mind, this is not a shuttle. They can't land if they have an emergency. They would have to abort, and the spaceship would then parachute back down into the ocean. So they had to have abort zones all the way up the East Coast, and they were literally numbered. One Alpha, two, uh, one Alpha, one Bravo, for example. Two Alpha, two Bravo, two Charlie, all the way up to Newfoundland, and then out to Shannon, Ireland. So thankfully, they didn't have to execute any of those. The thing went off perfectly, and they're on the way to the station. Brian, back to you. Tom Costello, I have a question about uh, atmospherics. Um, having been there for launches oh, sure, of the old school <laughs> rockets, okay, and knowing that that feeling you got in your chest cavity, the uh, yeah. the ground shook. Um, what what was it like for this? This is not the caliber rocket, the diameter rocket, the thrust of the rocket that you and I grew up watching. Yeah, it is 1.7 million pounds of thrust coming out of nine Merlin engines for that Falcon 9 rocket. I gotta tell you, it's been nine years since I stood here for a shuttle liftoff, but this seemed to be awfully powerful. I mean, it would seem to rival that. Uh, it's just from the experience of standing here, right? The building is shaking and the roar, and we heard some car alarms going off, as is so often the case when you have a big rocket liftoff. It was every bit as exciting and thunderous, I think, uh, as, as those earlier missions with the space shuttle. Now, I'm not old enough to have watched Apollo in person, but I'm certainly an Apollo geek, and boy, I wish I had, because the, the structure itself of, of, of Falcon 9 reminded so many of us of the Saturn V rocket that used to lift off here and carry Apollo astronauts up to, uh, up to the moon. But it was really a thrilling day here, and if this is now the future of space, of, of space travel, out of Kennedy Space Center, uh, what an exciting series of launches we have in store for us. Tom Costello, uh, thank you for that, for all of it. Um, and uh, it's an exciting day indeed. Uh, looking now at just nothing but wow. blue sky. Uh, awesome, that huh? is the yeah. we just glad I came so you can see the that. Yeah. Of, Come on, um, you are. All right. all right, this is replay of the